The Bob Murphy Show, episode 119. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. In this one, I'm going to be talking to economist Guido Hulsman. So many of you probably know him. He's a senior fellow with the Mises Institute. He's also an economics professor at the University of Angers in France. And in this episode, we got three main things we cover. First, uh, what made me get him on when I did is I saw an article he had at lourockwell.com entitled A Protest from France or An Economist Protest, something like that. I'll put the link in the show notes page. It was excellent. It was like the single best thing I had seen in terms of laying out the case for why he as an economist was skeptical of the policies in France that are similar to what's going on here in the United States. Um, having everybody stay home, not go to work and so forth. And so Guido had a, a comprehensive critique of, of that whole approach. Then we talk about, you know, I'm going to have him on. I had to bring up his Mises biography, um, to magisterial work. And so we talk about that a little bit, but then the main thing we spend the last half or so of the episode talking about Guido's novel theory of interest. So if you don't know, I of course have a critique of the so-called pure time preference theory of interest that Mises developed and, you know, the standard and Austrian tradition since that point, Rothbard, Kersner both embraced that. And so I have a critique of that. And then Guido also has a critique, but Guido's suggested replacement is not my suggested replacement. So in any event, I, I wanted to focus on that. So that is the, uh, the geek portion of the podcast in the second half there. Uh, I could have had him on for a long time. We could have talked for a while on all this stuff, but he had time constraints, so it's only about an hour long, but I think you'll enjoy it. Without further ado, here is my discussion with Guido Hulsman. Guido, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Well, oh, thanks for having me, Bob. <laughs> so we were chit-chatting before we started recording here that we're both at home, so I don't want to dwell on this because I want to get into the more academic stuff, but your article, um, A Protest from France, was one of the single best pieces I saw, you know, just laying out. You know, oh, that's very kind. Thank you. So, I mean, do, do, just sort of like to give a commercial for the reader, do you want to just summarize some of what your main point? It was it was a long article, but, you know, you were, I guess you guys are in lockdown there in France as well? Yes, we are. We have been since uh, March uh, 15th. And uh, I I was uh, flabbergasted at first. Sometimes I still uh, wake up and say, well, is this all for real? So I right. sometimes still think that I'm dreaming. Uh, it's not a nightmare, but it's, it's still, it's really unreal. And uh, the, the reason why I wrote this article was because I was uh, also flabbergasted by the explanation for these policies given by the president of France, Mr. Mm -hmm. Macron, mm -hmm. uh, who had made these announcements uh, just the day before, respectively four days before. And the, the reasons that he given were, were very um, extra extraordinary. So he said, we, we need to lock down everybody in order to save lives. And I immediately said, well, this is uh, this is strange because we've never done anything uh, like this before. I mean, that we've, we could have done various things to extend lives and save lives, both in France and in other countries by various policies, but we have never done this. I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, so, uh, yeah, so I found this, uh, this remarkable. And then uh, one of the first things that he also said in his address was that we should trust the experts. And that immediately um, uh, uh, provoked my, 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 my contradiction. I said, well, I mean, this is, this is weird, right? Because, I mean, how come that uh, if we are faced with a new situation, a new virus and so on, how come that the government out of all organizations knows best, who knows really best how to deal with this? I mean, this is, would be the first time. <laughs> and uh, so I found this just very weird. And so, and so then I said, at, at the time when he made this, I was involved with a seminar in Germany. There's the German uh, Mises Institute. Uh, they're sitting in, in Munich and they're having, uh, they have an annual seminar in, in Frankfurt. So I mm -hmm. went there, and my, my friends, uh, uh, Philip Bargos, whom you also know, and mm -hmm. Johnson Pollard. And so we discussed uh, this and we were all 
uh, against this. He's got five things. And then uh, I promised uh, to Lou Rockwell that I would send him an, an article on this whole thing. I started writing during the, the conference mm. uh, this thing, but uh, then I also got hooked up. And, you know, uh, very often when I feel uh, emotional about something, I uh, slow myself down mm-hmm. because I don't trust my uh, my feelings. Very often the feelings are correct, but mm. I'm um, I just... Uh, I'm so suspicious about my own feelings. So I said, okay, no, don't send it right away. So I started working on something else. I have a book to work on. So I fully delved into my book and didn't do anything else. And uh, But then two or three weeks later, then uh, somebody else asked me for an interview. I was given an interview on the, the COVID policies. And then I sent the, the piece to Lou Rockwell in which I make these three points, right? So I mean, this uh, saving life uh, maxim it's just uh, very extraordinary. I think it is, uh, it's just uh, a completely new political maxim that brings us on a very slippery slope, very dangerous. Uh, and then it's plain wrong to tr- just trust the experts because you don't know who the experts are. I mean, who is really the expert is not something that's written in stone. It's certainly not somebody who's working for a government organization. It's something that you know a priori. Mm-hmm. It's precisely something that comes to know in the process, right? And science is, is a great, very precious tool, not because we know once and for all and for all times, but because it's a process by which we uh, check premises and we check evidence and, and so on, and then come to know what, what the uh, right, uh, and causal analysis is what the best way to treat a uh, condition is. I mean, there's something that uh, also um, comes to be known in the ping pong process, right? Pe- some people find out a little bit, and then other people, build, based on this, elaborate and, and so on. So it's really, it's it's the process. It's not a state of affairs, right? Mm-hmm. And the third thing was um, that uh, I think uh, all these policies are, uh, obviously premised on uh, an abysmal ignorance of economics. So all of these people are treating um, uh, a pandemic problem only from the point of view of an epidemiologist or a virologist and so on. And that is just uh, not the right way to go about this. So you need to have a minimum of economics. Otherwise, you will be drawn very quickly into centrally planning just about everything. And this they cannot do. And then they are very quickly they're at the end of their, their wits, uh, even as far as epidemiology is concerned, because all these reasonings from an economic point of view are uh, what you would call partial equilibrium analysis, right? It's all uh, microeconomic reasoning. I mean, if everything rests, uh, else stays the same, then we need to do this and that, and then we'll get the thing under control. Well, I mean, <laughs> in a, a society based on the division of labor, it's not that everything stays the same if you lock everybody right, down. Right. It's, it just doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, just right. a simple example for the listeners, like th- this, the quantity of masks and gloves and hand sanitizer lotion that comes out is not a fixed thing that just comes from the air. Like if people aren't going to work, then that's going to eventually dry yeah. up. So just little things yeah. like that, even, like you say, even just from the narrow point of view of how to best minimize the spread of this thing, like it's not yeah. obvious, you know, what, what the right policy is. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, great. So I will link to So folks, this is bobmurphyshow.com slash 119. So I'll, of course, link to that. But I wanted to also spend a little bit of time on your your biography of Mises. So can you talk about that project? Well, uh, that's, uh, uh, it was 10 years of my life. Uh, Lou Rockwell, um, I had met Lou Rockwell in the, in the mid-1990s, so 94 or something for, mm-hmm. for the first time. Then, uh, uh, he had invited me to uh, lecture at the Mises Summer University. I think you were there in those years also, right? Right, 95, 90, 96? Uh, I think 98 was the first time I went, maybe something you like that. Well, 98 the first mm-hmm. time? Okay. Well, mine was 95. Uh-huh. I immediately jumped in. I was never there really as a student. I mean, you're always a student. I mean, even if you're, if you're one of the, the uh, lecturers, you're always mm-hmm. a student as well. But so I was immediately lecturing uh, at the conference. And so we made acquaintance uh, for, for two years about, and I went to the Austrian Scholars Conference, that was the name at, at the time, and I, uh, whatever else, uh, other conferences they had. And then he asked me in early 97 whether I would be uh, available to write a Mises biography. And that was in the context of the uh, discovery of the Mises archives in Moscow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that, uh, so Mises died in 1990, uh, 1973, and he had come to the U.S. in uh, 1940, right? And he had to leave Vienna. He came from the U- to the U.S. from from Switzerland, where he had been working from 1934 to 1940. And during his uh, years in Geneva, he was 
most of the time he was going back and forth uh, with, uh, to, to Vienna, to his old, old residence, until uh, the National Socialists took over, right? So they invaded uh, Austria in, 19, in March 1938. Mm -hmm. and as from that point, Mises could no longer return to Austria without exposing himself to uh, incarceration. Uh, and, uh, so and, the, and for the people uh, who might not realize, National Socialist is Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes You're calling him by the full term. I always yeah. spell it out because yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's I always get the impression that this is a wholly different yeah. universe, right? <laughs> they, they are the socialists on the one hand and right. the Nazis on the other hand. But from an economic point of view, it's not that, uh, that uh, different, uh, right. uh, uh, that much different. I mean, uh, uh, organiz from the organizational point, there's virtually no difference. Right. Uh, right. I mean, the, the objectives, of course, very different. And, uh, okay, we'll leave this aside. But anyway, so he... Um, uh, he had all of his correspondence in that Vienna apartment. Mm -hmm. And the Nazis were taking this over. And at the end of World War II, the Red Army took over a train full of documents uh, from uh, regime opponents of, of the National Socialists, right? So they had uh, some archives in which they'd collected all these documents from Mises, but many other people as well, so who were often communists and uh, social democrats and what have you, uh, Jews, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Nazis had brought them all together in, uh, in, a, in a train, and the Soviet just had to take over the train, and they had it, uh, took it to, to Moscow and then stored all of this material in a secret archive. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably in order to, well, sift through all of the information that was in it to find out something about people who would survive into the post-war period so that they might have discriminating material or background info, uh, information about personal relations. So, well, I don't, I don't know what their motivations were. In any case, they kept this material. Mm -hmm. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in the early uh, uh, 1990s, the existence of that archive became known to the outside world. And uh, one of the first uh, guys who went over there was a, a team of Austrian uh, historians. And they, one of the first things they did was to establish a list of the contents of the, um, uh, of this archive. Uh, one, one of the elements were the Mises documents. Mm -hmm. Now, these were not the star documents, not the most important ones. The most people were interested in the archi uh, archives from Auschwitz. They were also in that, in that uh, archive, right? So mm -hmm. the whole documents where they said, well, uh, according to the, uh, the the German authorities of the Austrian camp, well, uh, the Auschwitz camp, who died there and how many people and so on, they had all these statistics. Um, and that's the reason why most of the people were interested in sure, this right. particular archive, right? So I go there. I, I was, I think, probably the second Austrian economist who went there. The first one was Richard Eberle. Right, yeah. Richard, Richard got wind of this um, around 1992, 93, right when the Austrians first published their um, discoveries, so what was mm -hmm. in the arc. And Richard got funding from Liberty Fund, I think, and he went over to, to Moscow and made copies in the mm -hmm. archive and so on, And uh, because he had been working on a Mises biography for a while. Yeah. So I had a look at the, the archive in, uh, in 1998. So I went to Moscow, did the same thing that Richard did, tried to get as many copies as possible. They were very cooperative at the time because uh, well, they were very short of dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you a dollar and I paid one dollar per copy, it was a lot of money. So I paid in total more than six thousand dollars, so six thousand five hundred copies or something like this. Mm -hmm. That was a huge sum of money. And uh, it was very funny uh, because, uh, of course, you had these huge stacks, right, of, of paper, and I couldn't just carry them with my luggage out of the country. So I sent them with the post. It's something I wouldn't do today. I was, I was, uh, was many things that I did at the time was were quite uh, well, well, funny in retrospect. And so I sent all of this stuff to to Auburn, Alabama, and uh, it arrived at a day when they had a terrible tornado. Oh wow! <laughs> blowing through <laughs> through Auburn, so it could have been blown all the way, right? But it did survive, and and I got to work on this material then in uh, late '98 or uh, early '99. And then started in earnest. Uh, and I'd done some reading of, uh, of course, on this. Yeah, so this is how the process uh, started off. And um, then by 2002 or so, uh, Lou got a little impatient and says, oh, when, when's the book coming? So I got this question. I hated this question. How's the book coming? Mm. What's going on? And then I think I gave him a first uh, version in uh, 2003. That was about half of the manuscript. Mm -hmm. 
And another two years later, I had the complete manuscript. So by uh, August or September 2005, I had finally the complete manuscript, the first draft. And of that complete manuscript, uh, we took, um, uh, I think, uh, something like 60 or 70 percent. I wouldn't watch it exactly, but this this order of magnitude. So a lot was cut off. Um, and there was a guy that they hired, Jeff Tucker was at the time at the Mises Institute, and he was supervising the uh, editorial side of, of this project. And he hired a guy who was really excellent in uh, copy editing, excellent copy editor by the name of B.K. Marcus. Mm -hmm. I've never met this person uh, uh, live. Or had, or we only had an internet um, correspondence. Mm -hmm. I didn't even see you. Like, I just see you now on, right. on Skype. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. So but anyway, so uh, and then we had from then on, so uh, September or so uh, 2005, the, we, it took us another two years really to uh, finish, finalize, uh, cut out the edges and then so on, or, and find a suitable publisher. And, and eventually the Mises Institute decided to publish it uh, itself, which mm -hmm. for something for which I'm very happy. Right? You know, if you're an academic, you know this as well as I do, that if you publish with the Mises Institute, that's not necessarily something that boosts uh, your credentials mm -hmm. in the academic uh, community and that uh, gives you brownie points that you might need to climb up uh, the academic ladder and so on. But I uh, have never been really interested in these things. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, what was always most important was uh, liberty. Uh, so to do really what I thought was important, not what other people thought important that I should do. Right. So, uh, and working then with the publishing with the Mises Institute and the uh, Jeff Tucker and Lou Rockwell at the time, they've, they've come to the same conclusion that they would have to make way too many compromises uh, when publishing this with um, an academic, uh, reputable, reputable academic publisher. Right. So, right. because these guys, um, especially if you work with a reputed uh, publishing house, it's a little bit like working with a bank. They do not want to take any risk. Right. right. If you look at um, uh, academic publishing, it's actually uh, really fa fascinating. If you look, for example, at Keynes, right? He was working with Macmillan and, and so on. And they would just publish anything that he would put up and anything that uh, somebody out of the Keynes orbit would put up. And so it was with many other uh, publishing uh, house and uh, intellectual relationships also in Germany and France. You have obviously the same, same things. So my point is it works well if you are at the beginning of a movement mm -hmm. and then it becomes um, uh, uh, it's a huge inertia that sets in because once the founding generation is gone, then these guys, they just want to be respectable. Mm -hmm. That's their most important. They don't want to take any more risk. So if you send them a manuscript, they would give it to three or four people that, of whom they would think that they are experts. And in fact, of course, you as an author, you always know more sure, about right. the subject than, than all of these guys. So they would come up often with very silly pro proposals. They don't like sometimes the way you phrase certain things or how you articulate this. And so, it, in fact, what it boils down to is that uh, they make your life miserable and they, they block you. Mm -hmm. And of course, you say, uh, uh, especially as a young author, author, you say many silly things. But um, uh, of course, that's the risk that you take, right? Mm -hmm. As a as a as an author, of course, you, you sometimes you're wrong. Right. And uh, but but why should you not be allowed to publish something that's wrong? I mean, if it's uh, unless of course it's 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 uh, malicious and you just want to spread falsehoods or something. Right. Like this is something different. Uh, but why don't shouldn't be allowed? You should be allowed to to make an honest uh, error, right? Mm -hmm. The most important thing is to get the things out that are. Uh, interesting and valid and um, uh, truth for, that might uh, help other people to move on from where you've left off. Uh, nobody's obliged to, to copy your errors, but other people might be interested in, in just reading what you have to say about a topic, especially if it's a biography uh, based on uh, archival material that hadn't been covered by anybody. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in this case, I had covered not only the archive, uh, the secret archive in Moscow, but I was also the first one who had systematically evaluated uh, all material in the uh, Grove City archive. Mm -hmm. Because Mises, uh, after his death, his wife had sold all of his uh, post-World War II uh, documents to uh, Grove City College. At, at the time, the reason why they were interested in this was because Hans Zenos was, was teaching there. So Hans Zenos convinced the uh, uh, leadership of, of the college to buy this material from mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Magnus von Mises. And so they had about, what, about 10,000 pages or something like this of material. So, right, I mean, my, my book, whatever its, its failings and so on is, it was the first book that really assesses this material, 16,000 pages just of material, systematically. It's the first book of this, of this sort. So whatever silly things I might say mm -hmm. in the process, it's still interesting to see, okay, what's in there? Right. And, uh, and what can you derive from this? So I like people say, oh, wow, I mean, uh, this is interesting, but certainly your Hilsman is wrong in this and this, or yeah, there might be other things uh, that we should also look into starting from there, right? I mean, this is how the uh, whole uh, scholarly process works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not near perfection when, when you publish a book, uh, but it's, it's a first step, or it's a further step. Wait, um, is there anything that, like, and I don't know if this is a, is a good question to ask, but like, when you were doing the research, was there anything about Mises' personal life that ended up in the book that, you know, surprised you or, you know, in other words, what, yeah, that's, I'll leave it at that. No, uh, I mean, uh, especially there is not much about his personal life, right? Mm -hmm. This, uh, this man was really super discreet. I mean, he's uh, like many uh, males, right? He's, uh, of course, you cannot compare his interior life probably to what you would find with a, with, with a woman or something, right? Where the social dimension, the emotional dimension is much more important in the first place. So, uh, right, uh, there's a reason why there are much more artists than a male, right? Something mm -hmm. like this. Now, Mises was definitely not an artist, but he was very discreet. I mean, uh, he was the kind of person who, who um, uh, lived out all, also in, in, in private, his status as a professor, right? So he was a professor, was something serious and... Um, uh, uh, would not talk about his feelings, would not talk about uh, just any, of course he had views on various things, but he would not necessarily pronounce himself. Mm. It's uh, certainly not in writing on, on uh, all these questions. So certainly many things have been said in dinner conversations, I imagine, but even there I would imagine he's just not necessarily, he's not the type who would burst forth and just sell his opinion on, on all subjects. I imagine him even there to be rather um, um, held back and, and just come occasionally when, when others would say something uh, like this. So the bottom line is we don't know much about him. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the, the most interesting material that I found there, the, uh, the things that say most about him as a person uh, was probably some of the postcards that he could send to his mother during World War I. So these are left, but these were only postcards, right? And they were subject to uh, uh, censorship, uh, right? So, I mean, you yeah, had to hold back as far as um, political assessments and so on is concerned. Um, and it's just a, a, a postcards so you wouldn't say anything very intimate, really, to your mother, even on a postcard. Right. Then the other thing um, uh, was uh, his correspondence with his later wife, Margaret von Mises, because they had a stormy, heated relationship uh, at the beginning. And uh, I, uh, and she uh, had sent him a couple of letters. He had res uh, responded. Um, uh, it was, was deep disappointment and deception uh, around 1927, if I remember this correctly, 27, 28, uh, which led to the uh, postponement of their marriage. So they were, they were, the, 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 the uh, relationship was icy for a few years and eventually then they married in 1938. But you see, in this, right, it's not, it, it gives you just a glimpse of I mean, how would he deal with something that is really emotionally very stressful for him. But obviously he was disappointed in, in, mm -hmm. in, in the world. And even then he was very controlled, right? He was not mm -hmm. somebody who would shower, there was no invectives that he would use or something like this. So it's really somebody who's very uh, controlled, very measured. Mm -hmm. in the things that he said. Probably he's much more brutal in some of his uh, assessments of economic policy. He right, says, right. oh, these guys are incapable and they're, they're incompetent, or whatever. Right? He would say, some, would you use some vocabulary of, of this sort? Uh, but, not, but not in, in these private things. He was a very, very discreet person. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, I mean, I've noticed, of course, I have to rely on the English translations, but the younger Mises was more pugnacious like i like his critique of the socialist calculus or you know the socialist commonwealth he talks about like people living in cloud cuckoo land and stuff like that in the english translation whereas later it's more uh so i'm wondering in the in the german is does that is that true too like when he was younger yeah. was he more uh, of a brawler yeah. and and that's also the testimony of the students right mm -hmm. that 
he would not suffer fools gladly. So mm -hmm. he would, <laughs> if he felt somebody was really talking nonsense, he would say, that is nonsense. Right. Right? And so uh, well, it's a venerable academic tradition, right? right? That you take off the gloss and then uh -huh. uh, say these things. But so he was a very different person when it comes to academic debate. Uh, right. when he was lively and, and so on. But then in, in his private life, I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. Okay. Okay, well, I know we, we have limited time here, so I'd like to transition to your um, your QJ article, A Theory of Interest. And I've, it's a big one, so obviously folks will I'll link to it, bobmurphyshow.com slash 119. But here, just maybe to, to give the outlines. So let me just help you, you know, set the framework, and then, of course, you can you can take it from there. So early yeah. on, you say that Bumbavark's approach to the interest question was actually yeah. different from Menger's. So can you just explain that briefly? Well, uh, uh, Bavak was the first uh, economist who interpreted uh, the interest problem, right? So the, the, the interest problem is why do um, factors of production have a lower value uh, than uh, the products, mm -hmm. right? So he was the first one to um, interpret this as a value problem. That is ultimately as a problem relating springing from choice. Mm -hmm. right? Something that, that is rooted in choice, in the, the, uh, the, in the fact that we make choices. Whereas Manga, um, in Manga's work, there was this uh, tension, right? Because, uh, because on the one hand, he had insisted, well, that um, the value of uh, factors of production is derived from the value of uh, products. Mm -hmm. And it was an important point because it was, well, it's not as you had it in classical economics, cost of production theory, that the the value of the costs of the uh, of, of the factors is transmitted onto the products right so it's the other way around right factors mm -hmm. of production are valuable because the products are valuable not the other way around so he had this right on the other hand when it came to discussing interest he uh, argued in f along f fairly conventional lines right he says well we are actually uh, um, we we are paying um, uh, uh, so, so, so interest is a remuneration for the use of a good, right? right. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, let's say if, if I get a credit, I restitute, uh, so I receive whatever, uh, 1,000 euros, and then a year later I pay back 1,100. Then Menga would say, well, I'm restituting the 1,000 and I'm paying 100 extra for the use of the uh, 1,000 during that time. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very conventional argument, and so it comes from the, the Middle Ages. And Bill Barbeck explains very well that uh, this way of conceiving of, uh, of, the, of uh, the, um, uh, the, the loan contract um, uh, springs from juridical thought. Mm -hmm. right? So it's jurists who came up uh, with, with this kind of, uh, of reasoning, but it's not economists who came up with this. I mean, there were very few economists in the Middle Ages in right. the first place. Right. But then the economists take this up. Uh, and they don't really question this. The first one really to question this uh, was Ben Barthag. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is at, 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 at heart, it's an exchange that's taking place. I'm not receiving thousand now and I'm restituting the, the, the same thousand a year later and then paying you something extra. That's not actually what corresponds to reality because it's not, for, in the first place, I don't pay you back exactly the same 1,000 euros that I've received from you. Right. Those thousand I've spent them a long time ago, right? right. So what, what, what I'm really doing is to exchange two different sums of money. I receive now 1,000 and I'm exchanging against, against another payment that I make in a year from hence, which is just higher. Mm -hmm. right. Now the question is, why is it higher? And uh, Ben Barbeck argued, well, this is uh, because uh, uh, present goods have a higher value than future goods. So therefore, I have to pay back a higher sum in the future in order to compensate my partner for his uh, pr uh, time preference, right? He wishes, he prefers, in fact, the thousand now. So uh, the only reason why I would give them up is because I offer a greater sum in the future. And for me, it's the same thing. I'm ready to pay a greater sum in the future because that's, for me, less important than the thousand that I get now, right? We both have time mm -hmm. preference. So that's really a great originality in, in, uh, in Burma. Mm -hmm. So let me just, just crystallize that to make sure the listeners got that. So you know, the issue with interest is, oh, you, you're a, a business owner and you spend, let's say, like a thousand euros on factors of, you know, you hire workers, you, you know, spend 500 mm -hmm. on the workers, you spend 300 on the raw materials, da, 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 da. you spend a thousand out of pocket. A year later, you sell the product that those things made for 1100. 
And so that's the issue, that discrepancy. And so Menger was in a long line of economists who was trying to find where's the missing factor. We know we spent 500 for the labor. We know we spent 300 for the, you know, the, the semi-finished goods. Mm -hmm. We spent other 200 on rent. And now there's another hundred dollar payment for some factor, some input, because it's got to be that the sum total spent on the inputs equals the output, you know, to make an equilibrium at least because competition mm -hmm. would arbitrage it away. So he was looking, whereas Bombavik was saying, no, it's that value differential is the thing to be explained. That's what interest is. Exactly. Okay, okay yeah. great. So then what, what's the, uh, what, what's one, one or two made, what are some problems with the Bombavikian approach then? Like, why didn't he just, why wasn't that the end of the, of the issue? Well, Bombavik, uh, I mean, in the, the article that you mentioned, right? So, so I point out that then the, the, the explanation that Bombavik gives, right? I mean, is uh, so he wants to explain uh, the, this this value differential, and for him it has something to do with the fact that we're exchanging present goods against future goods, right? And um, this is uh, this is not a very satisfactory explanation, as I point out in the article. Now he caught me a little bit off guard because I didn't reread my article again, so I don't have uh, in my mind all the arguments that came up. Big, but I, I think uh, w one problem was that. Um, uh, well, you need to presuppose that uh, the the goods that you exchange, right? I mean, they're physically the same. Uh, then you say, okay, well, I'm giving a greater quantity in, in the future. Uh, uh, we say, well, these are the same goods and I'm giving a greater quantity. Uh, one problem here is that from an economic point of view, it might very well be that uh, whatever, uh, uh, 1,100 euros in the future, uh, from economic point of view, might be a different good than 1,000 euros now, mm -hmm. right? because they play a, diff a different role. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, it's, it's not clear why it should always be the case that we uh, prefer a future, go uh, a present good to a future good. Sometimes we want to have uh, goods at a certain point of time, so we might actually prefer to have uh, whatever 1,000 uh, euros. In exactly one year in the future, because we need to pay make a payment of this and that sort, we need to uh, we prefer them exactly then rather than now. We might not uh, not have a project uh, right now exactly for these one thousand euros. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's not it's not clear that why it should always be the case that future goods have a higher a lower value uh, th th than present goods, right? Not uh, certainly not in all circumstances. And Bill Barbeck himself. Like most other economists who had uh, in, um, endorsed the time preference theory of interest, admitted that it's not necessarily the case, not a mat matter of logical necessity, that present goods be preferable to future goods in general. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so for Bimbala, it would have been possible, yeah, there might be situations in which uh, it is the other way around. And Frank Fetter had also said the same thing. And Erling Fisher had the same, said the same thing. Yes, there might be other situations that's the other way around. And it, actually, it was this fact that first piqued my interest. Right? Because, you know, one of the reasons why I've, I've become interested in Austrian economics was because it was um, uh, this idea of praxeology, right. Right? that you have a pure logic of action. Um, now, if there can be an exception to a rule, it's just the general rule, well, okay, that makes it already much less interesting because mm -hmm. then you get into empirics. Uh, okay, that, that's not something that's wrong, but it just, you would say, well, a, a theorem that says, well, in most of the times you prefer present goods to future goods, but not in all times. Well, uh, that's not the same thing as, say, for example, uh, the law of diminishing marginal utility, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or a variant of this would be the quantity theory of money or something like this, right? So it's it's not in the same league. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I was interested in this. Is it really the case that um, uh, interest um, has only a, a contingent explanation, right? Mm -hmm. It might be the case or might not be the case. Or is there really is there something more uh, general about this, something uh, ineluctable? Uh, it's necessarily the case it's normal that there be uh, interest payments or return on capital, right? That, that is what, what uh, piqued my interest. Um, and certainly also the interest of Mises, because Mises' uh, intention was to build a praxeological science. Mm -hmm. So he had to deal with this issue. Now, it's very interesting how Mises uh, 
interprets time preference theory because it gives a very different explanation than Bombardier and Feta. What Mises says is the following: said uh, each time we act, we prefer that the uh, consequence that results from our action be obtained sooner rather than later, because that's the very point why we why we act. Mm -hmm. right? We're talking now because we want to uh, obtain the uh, the result, the interview. We want to have this sooner rather than uh, than later. Now, clearly interpreted in this way, it is uh, time preference is something that is necessarily involved in any single human action. We cannot imagine an action in where it would be absent, right? Mm -hmm. Necessarily, when we do something, where we want to attain this uh, result sooner rather than later, otherwise we wouldn't do it now. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a much stronger argument uh, than the one that we find in Bibabab. The problem is that it doesn't explain interest, right? because it doesn't follow from the fact that whatever I want to do now, I want to attain it sooner or later, that there be a spread between the prices of factors of production on the one hand and the prices uh, that we obtain by selling our product. Yeah, let me just let me just because that, that was a great part of your paper, and I did reread your right. paper just to make sure <laughs> I, I, I was prepared for this. So yeah. again, Mises when he addresses time preference, he wants to make it praxeological, so it can't just be an empirical like oh other things equal. Yet there's a tendency, but in principle yeah. there could even be a negative interest. Rate. Like no, that that's not for him. So time preference is a priori. Right. And the yes. way he demonstrates it or proves it is to say, like as you say, the the by acting, you're demonstrating that you prefer to achieve that result sooner rather than later. That's what time preference is. There you go. So action per se is bound up with positive time preference. Mm -hmm. So you don't object to that demonstration, but you're exactly. saying that type of if that's what time preference is, then that doesn't explain why in the market economy there's this apparent result that business people spend less uh, you know, out of pocket on the factors of production than they know exactly. or than they anticipate they'll sell the product for. And that's exactly. what the interest problem was that Bombavik formulated. So Mises hasn't right. solved the interest problem with his approach to time preference. Yeah. Okay. So then what you come along and then what, what do you, what do you say? Well, I, I say that um, uh, the, the, the root out of which there's value difference. So I, I fully accept uh, Ben Barak's approach and say mm -hmm. uh, interest must be interpreted as a value uh, phenomenon. So it must be interpreted as something that springs from choice. So how does it spring from choice? So it must be in choice, there must be a value differential somewhere. And the value differential that exists in all choices is the one between means and ends. Right? Means serve the ends. That's the very meaning of a means. And uh, therefore, means necessarily, by their very nature, have a lower value for the acting person than the end. Now, uh, that holds true subjectively, and it holds true in every single action, and it explains why for every single uh, uh, agent, every single action, we uh, would find a value differential between means and ends. It does not necessarily express itself in, in monetary terms, but of course it can express in monetary terms. And the reason why we find a monetary uh, rate of return on, uh, on capital invested is because people who are interacting in the market, right, they um, use means that they exchange on the market for money and uh, sell products again for money. So it's natural that they would want to obtain a higher uh, revenue, higher income than, uh, uh, than their cost, right? Mm -hmm. than what they pay for the, uh, the factors of production. So th this value difference is then rooted fundamentally in um, uh, the value difference between means and ends. Okay, so again, the how you're differing from the sort of canonical now post-Mises approach to, to interest theory is you're saying the the way Mises and Rothbard and most other Austrian economists nowadays would explain mm -hmm. interest is they say, oh, interest has to do with time preference, the fact that you know sooner is preferred yeah. to later, other things equal. Yes. And you're yeah. saying, no, what interest is about is the fact that an end is preferred to the means. Exactly. And the for me, um, uh, the, this time dimension is completely secondary. It's accidental. Mm -hmm. 
uh, interest, as I understand it, originary interest, the value difference between ends and means, it manifests itself in a time dimension. Named each time we have action that is extended in time, which involves buying stuff now that you use later. Yes, and it, and that covers, uh, admittedly, it covers most of the cases. Mm -hmm. But we also see it elsewhere. For example, if you have a simple exchange, right? We are exchanging an apple against a pear. Uh, then it is the case that if I am the apple owner, I buy the pair, then the pair, which is my objective, has a greater value for me than the apple, which is my means to obtain the right. pair, right? So it, even if there's no time dimension, because this exchange is a spot exchange that occurs right now, there's no time dimension, but we still have something, we have the value differential between ends and means. So it's more general, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's just more striking when we observe it in, in the course of time, right? And this is why interest payments are so, so well, so well, striking and have roused the interest of all kinds of observers. But it's just a particular uh, right. application of the general uh, principle. Yeah, let me just try to illustrate the difference because it, you know, this is, well, then I want to ask you why people have missed this up till now. So in the, in the standard approach, um, like if I have a, a a bond that was issued, you know, someone and says one year from now the owner, the bearer of this bond will get one thousand dollars, and so then right now maybe it's only it has a market value of you know nine hundred and fifty, and normally in this stuff too we would say oh and let's assume you're you're absolutely certain right so there's no risk of default or or you know the, the, mm -hmm. you're certain about it so like to put that you know so there's the uncertainty we're putting that to the side, and so. Most Austrians would say, right, the reason for that value differential, the reason you would only pay nine fifty today for an airtight claim on a thousand dollars to be delivered a year from now is because of time preference, that a thousand dollars today is more valuable to me subjectively than the prospect of a thousand dollars to be delivered in twelve months. Mm -hmm. But what's what I had never even thought of until you, you I read your paper was, okay, let's say it's twelve months from now and I have that bond. The fact that even then at that moment, when I turn it in to get the thousand dollars, I'm demonstrating I prefer the thousand dollars to the airtight claim to the thousand dollars. And so it's not merely the time differential that's explaining why is it that the bond is has a lower value, both subjectively and also market value, than the thing to which it's a claim. Hmm. Uh and 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 just in general, like anytime someone uses a means to achieve an end, like you're saying, that by that action, they've chosen the end over the means. You know, even if it's something like you got a, a can of tuna fish and you open it up to get the tuna out, you're demonstrating you prefer the end to the you know means. Otherwise, why did you make that exchange? And so that's exactly. a pretty basic. So I guess Manger was right to think the means derive their value from the end, but the his mistake was in thinking they 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 achieve the same value. Is that a way of putting it? Exactly, yeah, okay. and that that is uh, amazing, right? We is this is another uh, error committed by by Menga, and I don't know why he did this, but so he says, well, the uh, means received their value from from ends, so he had this, but he says that this value is necessarily the same as the value of ends. That doesn't follow. Right? Mm -hmm. Now the interesting thing is is Bumbarek, uh he had exactly, I mean, what what I presented in my my article, I said this is the, the correct theory. You find it, in fact, in Bombardak, only he didn't recognize the uh, the whole point, right? right? He said, yes, also in the relationship between factors of production and their and their uh, their products, right? The associated products. But he felt that for some reason he doesn't, he never discussed this, doesn't explain why he wouldn't see the, the root of the, the value of the interest phenomenon there, right? Mm -hmm. He said, well, it's more general. It's, it's um, present goods against future uh, goods. Right. And uh, it's it's much more simple to explain that. It's, uh, of course, much more simple to say, well, it has nothing to do per se with present and future, but it has something to do with um, uh, factors of production and their associated products. Right? Mm -hmm. And that, of course, plays out in a time-consuming production process when you transform uh, raw materials and uh, whatever, uh, uh, labor and so on, into a final product. But it also holds true if you're just engaged in trade. Right, and you buy stuff now, spot, and uh, you exchange it right away. Uh, there are two, right? You have right. the value differential between means and ends. Right, like the way we explain the emergence of indirect exchange. You know, yes. it, it, taking Menger at face value, it would be like, oh, once you get the medium of exchange, you would just keep it because it derives its value. You know, and but no, the yeah. fact that you trade it away again must show yeah. there is a differential. So, 
It's a very good point, right? Yeah. Because you, you really have in Mega, you have these two elements next to one another and mm. they're not coherent. Mm. Uh, but he doesn't see it. And right. still, right, money is one of the subjects on which he had written most. Yep. So I, I know you got to go here, but maybe if I could just ask you one last devil's advocate question just to help, because the, the stumbling block for me, so I, I love what you did in your paper, but I still wasn't sure the thing you're putting your finger on and you, is is the, the explanation for interest. So generally speaking, the longer the time lag, the higher the absolute value of the interest payment. You know, you, you borrow $1,000, the longer you take to pay it back, the the greater the interest payment's going to be in absolute terms, you know, not a per mm -hmm. annum. And so doesn't that seem like it has to do with the passage of time more than just the fact that, oh, means versus ends? Because in other words, why would the gap between means and ends be bigger for a longer loan? Isn't that just kind of a, a, a philosophical or a, a principled thing? The, the fact that loans so, what, are more what you mean so a, a value a, a difference that would not spring from the associated risk right because you have greater uncertainty if you protect yourself on a longer time no, no for, forget the uncertainty even like in a world of certainty i'm saying mm -hmm. i borrow a thousand dollars for one year versus for 10 years the mm -hmm. interest payment in absolute terms is bigger on the the longer loan but mm -hmm. isn't that means ends gap at least in principle kind of the same on both so if if interest mm -hmm. is about the gap between means and ends why does it seem like it's proportional or, you know, exponentially with the duration? Like, couldn't the time preference theorists say, come on, interest is clearly about the length of of the time gap? Well, uh, no, I, I uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, but I would have thought that this is um, it's just a consequence of arbitrage processes, right? Mm -hmm. if, if it were not the case that you would pay, uh, obtain a, more, uh, a higher interest payment for a longer period, then of course you would arbitrage uh, short-term financing against longer-term financing sure. in such a way until, until it becomes the same, right? So I, I think it's just a consequence of, of arbitrage that comes into play. Uh, I don't think actually, uh, but it's a, it's a good question. I've, I did not answer this really in my paper, mm -hmm. so I think that there's more room, uh, there's much more room for for work there. The the way if if, if I'm right in my interpretation, then uh, I would say that uh, it, it, it would seem to follow that uh, interest is determined by the by how much um, a means is an end in itself. Right? I mean, the means that we use in particular human labor is, of course, also an end in itself. Right? We, we, we are engaging uh, in activity to earn revenue, but uh, the activity, uh, of course, we, we are also selecting it because it is pleasurable to us right? and other things. Or we think it's important. We, we're rendering a service of society and so on. So the, uh, I therefore think that the, uh, the value difference between um, means and ends shrinks the more important the means become as an end in themselves. Mm -hmm. And the other way around, so you would have had very high interest if uh, the means that you use are really of no other interest than just for attaining this end. Then I would expect to have a higher, um, uh, a higher interest, a uh, higher mm -hmm. value differential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm not absolutely sure, uh, certain about this. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, great. So, uh, so folks, this is bobmurphyshow.com slash 119. Go to that link for all the, the links to these uh, articles we've discussed. Uh, my guest has been Guido Holzman. Guido, thanks for your time, and, and stay I safe out job. there. Okay, <laughs> so long. Bye-bye <laughs> now.